Hey, Facebook friends, we're here for the Silicon Valley Friday show. We've got John Markoff right behind me, I'm about to go live, so stay tuned. If you're watching this video, stay with us and make sure you comment. Live from Cube headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday show with John Furrier. Hello, welcome to the Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier. We are here in Palo Alto at the Cube Studios uh, with John Markoff, my guest this week. Uh, formerly of the New York Times, now still with the New York Times, legend, scribe in the tech industry. Goes way back to the old you know, computer world, info, info world, um, governed days of IDG, which was just sold to China. John Markoff, great to have you, good to see you. Hey, great to see you. We did a podcast 12 years ago in 2004 before podcasting even became big when I founded PodTech and and uh, that was supposed to democratize media. And the blogs emerged and now we have full circle back to 1984, with Donald Trump and the media, like, almost like it's the reverse of what was supposed to happen. It is a very strange time. And I, I mean, I'm, I think you figured out a lot more than I have. Remember, I'm a print guy. I started as a print guy and I ended as a print guy and the world has moved on. Well, we're investing a lot in print. I think that's the final leg of our stool, but video obviously is compelling. We've been doing the Cuban ultra successful um, and the Wikibon research team has been great. But the, the media landscape is just one I think backdrop to the bigger picture, which is um, there's a whole new world order and this whole fake news thing really was interesting because some of the conversation was some of those new generations have never even seen real news before. So they couldn't tell the difference between fake news and real news. And it's just, there's a new, the new signals are out there. Google's not driving, it's really more Facebook you're seeing this new platforms. Well, it's even more complicated. I mean, there has been this rich discussion of, rich is a word I use advisedly, of, of fake news, but I've actually been more obsessed with, with what's called fake traffic. Um, how do you know humans are watching what you're doing? Increasingly, people don't. And I think it's richly ironic at this point that you know, this model, advertising-based model, is, is being infected by robots. And what does that mean? I mean, it's interesting. One, a funny story from the, from the old uh, McGovern days, IDG, Dave Vellante, um, co-CEO with me, it's an angle, mentioned that McGovern once said to the, to the writers, imagine your audience that you're writing for. And they had measurement of, you knew what the, who the audience was. You knew their IT guys, they're interested in PCs or whatever, whatnot. Here, you don't know who your audience is because Google controls it. Now Facebook controls yeah, the identity. Is. The publishers don't have no iteration, no feedback loops yeah. if they're not tied into some sort of loop. That was one of the things that undercut the New York Times effort to go in that direction is there are these intermediaries who could actually sell our audience better than we could and let for less money. Yeah. And so, you know, the Times went back to the subscription model and it's nil, still not proven, but it looks yeah. like it's got a chance, not dead. Yeah. One of the good things is you know there are human beings out there and you know something about who they are. Yeah, I think there's a whole new revolution going on. I, you know, obviously we're betting big on video. We believe original content is going to be, come and make a huge comeback right now. It may not be value, but original content really, to me, will just kind of just vaporize all this noise, I think. So that's our bet. But in general, though, I think, you know, you were at New York Times, you just left. Uh, now you're, you're back freelancing, you're doing some stories. Uh, what are you up to? What's going on with your well, life? You got a book coming on? What's happening? It's complicated. So I have four desks now. <laughs> One is still at the New York Times, one's at home. Um, I'm at the Computer History, History Museum as a museum, which, uh, as a historian, which is just down the, the, the street. And um, they've basically brought me on um, to work with their program, and also they're subsidizing uh, a book that I'm working on, which is a biography of Stuart Brand. And Brand, most people know as the guy who put together the whole Earth catalog, um, a whole generation was influenced by that. It was sort of the web before the web, if you will. Yeah. But Brand was involved in a whole set of things um, uh, the Hackers Conference, The Well. Um, he wrote this article in 1972 in Rolling Stone where he really was the first person to sort of introduce a broad audience to personal computing and video games and, and computer networks. I mean, this is really early stuff. And I'm writing about him. It's kind of a social history. He's the spine of a set of events that created what I think of as a California sensibility, which has kind of infected the world, if you will. Yeah, and certainly has one of the things that really kind of gets me focused on and here at the team here and, and what I want to talk to you about is how outside of Silicon Valley, there is now a weird vibe around you see some corruption come out from uh, that venture back company, the, um, Theranos, and then you got the collection just happened. Obviously, everyone here pretty much for Hillary, pretty obvious. Um, but the libertarian culture of Silicon Valley and the risk taking and the, and the freedom people have here has spawned a lot of innovation. You've written about it, certainly. Your book, What the Dormouse Said, was all about counterculture spawning the computer revolution. But the people outside Silicon Valley want to be Silicon Valley, but at the same time, there's a lot of bash 
washing going on. There's yeah. a PR problem. Um, and the journalists are writing about it as more of a, I don't want to say Machiavellian kind of approach, but you know, Silicon Valley's got a PR problem and I don't think there's a problem. Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's really possibly easy to kill the golden goose, if you will. Um, one of the things that I've seen over a long, long time is you know, sort of why was Silicon Valley here? What was the spark that created it? What's the chemistry? One of the um, key aspects of Silicon Valley is um, it was a magnet for the best and brightest for the, from the entire world. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. And I think if you basically block that, um, if people go elsewhere, if people go to China or they go to Europe, um, the chemistry falls apart. And I, you know, yeah. I don't think it's guaranteed that Silicon Valley will survive forever. I saw the article in the New Yorker this week about the doomsday and how all the rich kids want to get, you know, this place and, and protect themselves. And I mean, I thought it was pretty dumb. I mean, it was pretty. I mean, I wrote that on Facebook and on my way back from Boston. Maybe I was a little bit jaded being on the East Coast, uh, but it didn't really encapsulate in my mind what the true Valley's doing in the sense of that's not the social norm. It was kind of a fringe, if you will. And it was a big time people mentioned on that Mayfield venture capitalists and people that I knew. Um, just seemed a little bit off, and uh... yeah. Although the the article did point to to people within the valley who were also very skeptical about this. There were there were you know there there were there were entrepreneurs in the valley who said you know maybe you should think about giving to the homeless shelter rather than trying to sort of protect yourself by running off into <laughs> some fortress that you've created in New Zealand or something else. But you know I he he wrote it about a particular time and place, which is right now, but that notion, that survivalist notion is not new. Yeah. I mean, survivalist, survivalist culture has been around with us for, for some time. Yeah. There are people who think that the world is always about to fall apart, and somehow until now, it, yeah. it, it, somehow, it hasn't fallen we apart. We had a good uh, venture capitalist on last week, Greg Sands, who's not well known, but he's a um, uh, Stanford guy, Harvard guy, and, and good VC, worked at Netscape as the first product manager, yeah. wrote the business plan, so he's about my age, wrote the, seeing the cycles from the internet side. Um, and he was talking about, yeah, mercenaries are, everyone wants to be a mercenary, but there's always a ratio of mercenaries, or as one of our other guests, Alan Cohen said, bomb throwers, um, to kind of make, shake things up, and then missionaries people actually doing the work. So if you go back to like the Intel days, those guys were just trying to make DRAMs. They weren't really out to change the world. Were they missionaries or were they mercenaries? I mean, Jobs certainly was playing a different role, but your thoughts yeah, on this, so, this so, cultural uh, thing. I mean, the culture of Silicon Valley, I, I, I've seen over and over again, this chemistry that comes together, which is a Jobs and Wozniak kind of mix. The, 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 these companies frequently have a guy like Jobs and a guy like Wozniak. Now Wozniak just wanted to build computers to share with his friends at the homebrew club, and Steve Jobs saw that there was a market for it, and it was that chemistry that made Apple. I don't think it would have happened without both sides of that coin. And the dynamics now of money making also plays into it. One of the things that happened just, uh, just this week was Cisco bought uh, App Dynamics for 3.7 billion. I mean, back in the old days, not to sound dated, but people went public to raise money. Yeah. Now they, go pop, they don't even have to go public, it's $3.7 billion. So you see a shift. So yeah. the question I want to ask you on this point is, you know, the Hewlett Packard days where I worked for nine years back in the 80s uh, and nine, early 90s was, they had, a, they had a sustainable company and they created jobs. They were doing tech for, obviously to make profit and they were you know, obviously profiteers, but they had this view of, uh, of culture and citizenship and they actually worked on important stuff yeah. that mattered. Yeah. And so we're seeing uh, the shift. I mean, the Cloudera founder was also on theCUBE and he said, we have the smartest br brains in the world working on how to optimize ad placement rather than solving big problems. And this is, comes down to a new demographic kind of call them post 9-11 children that actually look in the world differently and say, hey, I don't really give a crap about ad optimization. I want to yeah. actually solve the energy problem or cure cancer. So, you know, I, my last book was called Machines of Loving Grace, and it was actually based on something I saw when I was working on the book before that, which was called What the Dormouse Said. And that was that at the very dawn before the valley, the dawn of interactive computing, 19, early 1960s, there were two laboratories on either side of the Stanford campus. One was created by John McCarthy, called the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and one on the other side of the campus, which was Doug Engelbart, which was called the Augmentation Research Center. And this was just when interactive computing was getting out into the world. McCarthy thought that it would take him a decade to build a thinking machine, um, an AI and they would replace humans philosophically. That's where he was going. On the other side of campus, you know, it was Engelbart, and at that point he was thought to be kind of a, a weirdo. He thought that computers could be used to extend people, and that philosophical dichotomy really fascinated me, because 
it's a dichotomy, but it's also a paradox, because if you extend people, you need fewer people. So I wrote about that dichotomy and the rise of AI and robotics in the valley. And now, t to your point, what's going on um, is a, a lot of the big companies in Silicon Valley are actually thinking seriously about that, and they're thinking about their ethical responsibilities. And it's actually kind of heartening to me. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not entirely fooled by this. Sometimes it's just yeah. marketing. But I know the technologists inside these companies, and they're very serious about it because they realize the consequences of these technologies. And so um, I don't think that, I mean, I think that I, I give Silicon Valley um, technologists um, relatively high marks because in some, in some industries, people don't care at all about the consequences. In this industry, there's actually an active discussion about what the consequences are of the technology. What's your um, opinion to people out there who are saying, Silicon Valley, a bunch of people have their head up their butts, they're a bunch of crazies, loonies, they're out, <laughs> make a quick buck, you know. I mean, there's still so much work going on. Look at the automotive. You see GM, Ford, BMW moving all their R&D out here. There's a Detroit Silicon Valley connection going on. You mentioned Wozniak and Jobs and, and Engelbart yeah. and the other guy. It's the collision of these uh, approaches that yeah. makes magic. And I think that, I mean, it's a libertarian culture. I mean, I mean, this is a whole new thing. And what do you say to the folks out there that don't get this? Well, How do you describe the, the magic of Silicon Valley? The first thing I have to say is there's not one Silicon Valley. I've always thought that there have been multiple cultures inside the valley. I mean, going back to uh, the period before personal computing, I mean, there was a semiconductor industry culture, which was basically white shirts and pocket protectors. And then up the road in Palo Alto, you know, there was the, this much more long-haired culture out of which you got personal computing. And those cultures, they were separate. They, they mingled together. Um, and that's still true about the valley. Um, the valley uh, as a place has moved from Santa Clara. I mean, if you look at where the center of Silicon Valley is today by venture capital investment, it's at the foot of Potrero Hill in San Francisco. It's actually physically moved. And it reflects this kind of more cosmopolitan urban, uh, urban center. Um, it's still this kind of vast uh, magnet for the best and the brightest from the whole world, and I think that's a good what thing. What would Stuart Brand be doing if he was alive today in this well, culture? Stuart, would he, would he, would Stuart he, be, would he be doing movies, Silicon Valley? Actually, uh, would he be doing? I'll tell you what he's doing, because he's still alive. He runs this thing called the Long Now Foundation, which is up in San Francisco, and there's this wonderful arc. So if you go back to the very first Whole Earth Catalog, which Steve Jobs talked about in the Stanford commencement address, and you go to the first sentence, what he said is, we are as gods and we might as well get good at it. And draw that arc forward to what he's doing now. And inside the log now, he has this project called Revive and Restore. And it's gotten a lot of attention for the idea of bringing back the woolly mammoth. But what he's really doing is he's looking for species that are endangered um, and under pressure because of climate change. And what happens is their, their genomes uh, become more homogeneous and they are more at risk. And so he's basically playing God. He's trying to diversify the genomes of of entire species that are under risk. So that's a, that's a sort of hot potato from an ethical point of view, but I, th I think um, that it's a, you know, he's, he's still doing interesting and creative What do you think things. about the cult of Silicon Valley? This is, this is, this is the oh. hard question, because the venture capitalists, you go back when I was in business school in the 90s and graduated, you know, VCs walked on water, and there weren't a lot many of them, right? So now, people pretty much aren't looking at them as the gods that they once were. Now it's shifting back to kind of democratizing with angelists. You see all these crowdfunding, you see uh, incubators popping up. Um, is that the new culture of the cult? Is the cult still chasing well, the dream or? Okay, you know? so I really enjoy Silicon Valley, the series. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was going to hate it. And I, and I look and I go, I know that guy. Yeah. I know that guy. I mean, they really nail they some it. of the foibles of Silicon Valley. <laughs> Um, so the foibles are there. And they have the inside jokes too, that just eat beautiful. Yeah, you it's know. very entertaining. As opposed to Black Mirror, which is another series that I can't watch because it's too painful because it's too close to the truth <laughs> for the same kind of reason. Um, and do you think Silicon Valley is the Animal House version of the parody of Silicon Valley yeah, Animal House uh, yeah. being college reflection? Yeah, it's a little I, over the top. It's good. It's good. It's yeah. great content. But isn't it interesting that that's the view of Silicon Valley that the broader world gets? I mean, the people who have no sense of what Silicon Valley is. They think that that's real. And actually, it's pretty close in some cases. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, you got a lot of people come in. This has been the Silicon Valley dynamic for years. People come in and they think they can make a quick buck, and, but they realize pretty quickly that it's pretty boring and pretty freaking hard to start a company. Most of them fail, yeah. right? And there's a community going on, and there's a lot of back channel, a lot of information flowing around yeah. because of the, the, that culture of bringing people together. Well, I, you know, a recent book of the moment was a book called Chaos Monkeys, written by a guy who went from startup Antonio. to, yeah, 
Um, and uh, I thought it was interesting because I thought he did capture a particular moment in Silicon Valley. But when I read his, anytime he, write, he tried to write about history, he was wrong. Silicon Valley tends to look forward and not back. And, um, but I, but I, you're going to write a history book. Well, I'm a historian now. Yes. Well, and, and you're employed by the Community History Museum yeah, to do yeah. that. Well, we're going to talk more about that in our next segment. John Markoff here in the Cube. Great, uh, great conversation. Uh, he's seen the perspective. Now going to be documenting history, which I think is worthy. I think you know we want we do our part with the Cube videos to get the historic moments. Appreciate that. But I think the Stuart Brand thing. We're going to talk more about this whole Earth catalog impact. And is it still relevant today if you can read this book and it certainly it's, it, it, what is it going forward going to look like and how does that get modernized? We'll be right back with more after the short break. Why wait for the future? The next evolution in IT infrastructure is happening now. And Cisco's unified computing system is ready to power your data center in the internet of everything. Urgent data center needs went unaddressed for years. So Cisco wiped the slate clean and built a new fabric-centric computing architecture that addresses the application delivery challenges faced by IT in the dynamic environments of virtualization, cloud, and big data. Cisco UCS represents true innovation with revolutionary integration. It improves performance while dramatically driving down complexity and cost, far lower than alternatives from the past. Cisco's groundbreaking solution is producing real results for a growing list of satisfied customers now moving to unified computing. Transforming how IT can perform, pushing out the boundaries of performance and scale, and changing the face of business from the inside out, right now. The industry is witnessing the next wave of computing. So, why should your business wait for the future? Unify your data center with Cisco UCS. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here at the Silicon Valley Friday Show live in Palo Alto, California in our studios at our new Cube uh, Anchor Desk. I'm John Furrier with John Markoff. My guest today, great to, great to see you. Our last segment of the day here is really looking forward. As you mentioned on the last segment, Silicon Valley is about looking forward. And there's a lot of history to look at now, but you know, you talking about the, your first, one of your, not your first book, you think your second book was The Dormouse. Is that the third, I'd fourth? actually written two before, three before three that. Before, so your fourth book, yeah. what The Dormouse said, there is a, it's a short history in here in Silicon Valley. I mean, you have the HP going back to 1939 and the Stanford, but the real computer revolution Yep. The Gatesian, the Jobs, that Intel dynamic, really to me was that the, 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 the big, big wave. It started in the mid-70s. And, and what, we're only a few years, decades from that. So we're still early, it's a young Well, Silicon it's an Valley. interesting question. I mean, so I spent most of my career writing about this thing called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is about the ability to put, uh, at regular intervals, more transistors on a piece of silicon. And we're at a stage now, uh, 50 years in, where it's a real question of whether we're still on that pace. You could argue that we're at least stalled for a while. Um, the cost of transistors has stopped falling in the last couple of years, and that was a big deal. Because Moore's Law was about not getting faster and cheaper, it was about getting faster, faster, and, and, and cheaper faster. It was exponentials. Yeah. So if the exponential's over, is it going to continue to spin out new industries? Because that was the driving force. And so, I mean, it's well, a this real is, open this is question the thing, Jeff Frick and I talk about the, the line R and all the car stuff. The Moore's Law kind of is kicking in there. It's the price is dropping down yeah, from 50,000 down to nothing. Now you got NVIDIA, the star at CES this year. I mean, NVIDIA, a graphics car, now, they're, AI now they are an AI company yeah. powering, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the gaming, the you know, car experience, yeah. their software. I mean, that's a... It's interesting a, it's a, it's a big deal, but um, and and it's you know it's had this huge impact. But is it going to continue to accelerate at the rate it was? There, there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley that believe it will. I'm a bit of a skeptic. I yeah. think that we're a bit of a plateau. Yeah. And so I think we're hyped up. Um, when I see the we have a tool that looks at all the trending hashtags globally and in, in tech is IoT. IoT by far, Internet of Things is IoT is number one trending item uh, across the board consistently every day. Internet of Things seems because it hits AI, hits the human, it's that intersection of industrial to IT, yeah. um, in our, at least in our world. But that's I a add, very enterprise thing, though. Is, or is it? Is well, the, what's interesting, the analog was well, from our our cube go to hundreds of events, kind of horizontally out there and look at the, at the space. But here's what we observed the analog world is digitizing, right? And I think that is the digital revolution. And one of the things I've been saying is that we are in a 
counterculture opportunity where there's a digital hippie. I talked with Virginia Heffernan uh, when she came oh. on the Cube about her new book, Magic and Loss, which kind of teases out this notion of there's now the rebellion against That's interesting. I'm going back to analog. So there's now a kind of like digital hippie. Does she see a counterculture, a new counterculture? Does she argue that she there's She argues a with me that there's a counterculture where kids are actually leaving their cell phones on the weekend and that that's a cool thing. Hey, I left my cell phone for the weekend. Um, they're taking oh. LSD well, down their way to school, <laughs> microdosing. Um, they, they're actually going back to flip phones. There's a, there's a vinyl records. Uh -huh. There's an anti-digital this is not online, therefore it's more scarce and more relevant. So it's, a, it's, it's the hippies and, and they might not be smoking bad weed, but, but they're certainly smoking, <laughs> uh, doing something differently. Well, but so, you know, even in the original counterculture, there were people who were Luddites, basically mm -hmm. rejecting technology. But, you know, Stuart Brand represented a wing of the counterculture that was very positive toward tools and toward digital tools. And basically he was instrumental in reframing the way we looked at computers because remember, the free speech movement at Berkeley was about do not bend, fold, or spindle, or mutilate, right? They were, computers were seen as instruments of control. And then over the next decade, we went to this new kind of culture where computers were seen as instruments of liberation. So where are we now? Well, this is kind of why I'm trying to grok this because I, my vision is that I think that everyone who's digitized realizes, okay, I'm instrumented, I have no privacy, all these things are, and now the election, if you look at their world and say, what's going on? We're actually living 1984, which is mm -hmm. Steve Jobs actually threw the hammer against what actually is existing now, you could argue. And people have talked about that. So my, my thinking is, I think people are gonna recognize that it's not the end all be all to be digital and that you can actually do some things with digital that integrate the, the real world. Space, whether it's VR or other experiences that are not so automated or stale. And I don't know, I mean, I just think that's, if I was a young kid, what would what, I be doing? What I worry about most, actually, and I'm not certain about this, but you know the term the Borg mm -hmm. from Star Trek? <laughs> you know, re AKA, AKA Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon, and once when upon Gates time. was there, it was, Gates was referred to as the Borg, they own everything. Yeah, resistance that's now Amazon is futile, and you Google will be and Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> so I see a generation, I, mean, I come from a generation where we really hated taking direction from anybody. But I see a direction of younger people who take direction from the palm of their hand, from these algorithms that sort of come from their, from their or re, you know, everything from where to get Korean barbecue to who to marry. Um, and that's a cultural shift that really kind of, uh, it, it's, it's eerie to me uh, in the sense that yeah. um, if some sort of algorithm is making all the decisions, what's left for, for human creativity and So the augmented reality is interesting to me too, because if you can augment reality, then be, don't be afraid to wish for what you want, you might get it, but the downside is, this is first time societal problem. Yes. I mean, this is not something, I mean, self-driving yeah. cars, who's gonna, who's gonna manage that service? Although I think AR is a little farther away than people think. A lot of these things appear like <laughs> for 15 or 20 years before they show up in fries and are real, right? Yeah. I mean, and I think this might be the, the first failure of AR as opposed to the arrival of the AR universe. Yeah. I mean, VR, I think it's just, it's just all like, I mean, the chatbots to me is a great example. The rage of chatbots is just a, something pe people can put their mind around something, a mental model or a product, and say, oh, that's AI, and then that dies away. But I think AI is just a refunction, re rehashing of neural networks, software. You're starting to see you know, Moore's Law kind of thing kicking off with Amazon cloud technologies. Um, but I want to get your thoughts, one final parting thought on, yeah. on, on patterns and recognition. I mean, obviously, you, know, you can learn a lot by history, um, but you don't need to bank on it, but you can, now we have a body of work within Silicon Valley of which you were, in the front lines, uh, you were called the scribe of the of, of, of that generation at the time, documenting it New York Times and in previous life. But what can we learn from that? What's the pattern you've seen over the past few decades well, of success I and mean, so, entrepreneurial? So, what can people learn from the history? I, you know, I've watched people sort of make um, inaccurate predictions over a long, long period of time, and I'm, I've been curious about this. I have a theory, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm right, but I. I think that one of the problems and one of the interesting things about Silicon Valley is that people live in linear time. And for the longest time, the valley was on this exponential. And so it's very difficult to predict something that's not changing in a linear way. And so I, I think that, so if we're still on an exponential, yeah. it's still going to be very hard to predict. Maybe it'll get a little easier if we're flattening, flattening out. I talked with Jim Anderson, who used to be one of the early venture capitalists, uh, Anderson Pickering, then he's retired now. And he, we were having a glass of wine. He goes, you know, John, the key thing about venture capital is that you, no one really knows. And that it's often the ones that people hate, the contrarian yeah. approach that ends up being the big thing. And I think the movies people watch, the Jobs movie, the social network, 
these things kind of have to encapsulate and kind of story tell kind of probably more awkward moments than actually played out. I mean, yeah. it's doesn't ha it's not a fairy tale sometimes like that. Yeah. No, it's I, you know, I was part of this culture that grew up in believing in digital utopia. I mean, John Perry Barlow in what 96, uh, you know, a declaration of independence for cyberspace. And I've gone 180 degrees. I, you know, I used to be utopian, and now I, I, I feel that this online world that we've created, this, this cyberspace, is merely a mirror of the physical world, and it reflects everything good and bad about our world. And there's so I want to ask you a final question. Final, final question. You know, I uh, appreciate you being an advisor for our Tech Truth Initiative. One of the things we're passionate about is next generation journalism, being someone who's not trained in any kind of journalism myself, but kind of doing it for 10, 12 years now uh, in, in this new medium. Um, I want to get your thoughts to, for the young people watching. You know, you have a great uh, pedigree. You, your send off of the New York Times, all these of you that are still there, was pretty awesome. Watching the, your Medium post was, a lot of people love you and you're well regarded. Certainly your work speaks for itself. What do the young journalists should, well, should take away? Because you have a lot of wisdom, but they're looking at down the shotgun of a media landscape that is so foobarred and so screwed up and so like, yeah. wacky. I know. I mean, I just, the stuff that's happening is surreal. I know you, Talk about on your Facebook page, but what are, what are, what are, what are they? What's the secret to what, move forward in a really positive well, way? You know, since the the sort of the terrain changes so quickly, I think if they really want to be journalists, if they want to be reporters, um, the the simple thing to do is get an area of expertise and become a journalist. And you know, what I did is I got in and. I decided I was going to starve for five years and try to make it to a, a mainstream journalist publication, and it worked out. Now, I, and I was telling people the same thing, what's, what's, what's confusing about today is there's been a huge decline in employment in the mainstream media, and I was telling people, look at this pro proliferation of new sources, go find one of them, grow up with them. And I've been a little disheartened because that seems to be plateauing for the, mo for the moment, but I think if you look at things over five or 10 years, if you want to be a reporter, um, the cost of entry is so inexpensive. Remember, one of the best... Yeah, but now they're looking at a mainstream media that they just know there's con con people are, there's not a lot of seats at the table. No, but I mean, look at what I.F. Stone did during the 1950s. He ran something out of his, his garage, right, yeah. with his wife. Well, now people have Twitter. That's you can, still you can possible actually to do. blog now. Blogging actually is democratizing. Yeah. I, mean, you can put I don't just, think that's gone away. Yeah. I think that's still possible. I would still so tell somebody who wanted to be a reporter. And the difference between journalism and, and reporter it. is what? What's journalism and what's reporting? I mean, isn't reporting like the key thing? You're actually reporting things, right? well, like facts. Uh, uh, Not alternative facts, but like actually facts. There, <laughs> I've got it in, got uh, alternative facts in. There, the, the, journalism is a more pretentious way of calling yourself a reporter. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're reporting here at in Palo Alto, Facebook Live with John Markoff, a reporter in the journalism field now <laughs> on his own as a historian. Uh, John, great to see you. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming me. by uh, for our, our Silicon Valley Friday show. Every Friday, Morning, Silly Life Friday show with John Furrier. Thanks for watching.